Okay. Okay. Um, so hi everybody. How are you doing today? Are we good? good. Tired? Worn out? Like in the weather? Good? Alright. My name is Carrie Hill and I'm here to present tonight as a brain aneurysm survivor times two. One of my brain aneurysms ruptured and the other one didn't, so that was that was a good experience comparatively. I've also had about 10 to 12 trans ischemic attacks throughout my life over the last 20 ish years. So I'm just going to go over with you what my story is and what my journey was like. And if you have any questions or something seems similar to you or you want to talk about something a little longer that's a subtopic, I'm happy to do that as well, okay? So way back in 1999, I got pregnant with my son. I appreciate it. I got pregnant with my son, who is almost 20 now. Oh my gosh. So. I had trans ischemic attacks when I was pregnant. I had four of them and I didn't know what those were. I'd never had any trouble with migraines or anything like that prior to being pregnant. So they would just tell me they're trans ischemic, which is migraine related, so don't have any more babies. So I didn't have any more babies. He's my only one. About two years after he was born, I had another trans ischemic attack. Still no real root yet. Excuse me, you're talking in multiple people. What's a trans ischemic attack? Fair question. It's a mini stroke. So basically, half of your body will go numb, just like a stroke, where you can't control it. And then you'll be a little bit deranged or confused, and usually um, your tongue will go numb, your eyesight, you may see spots, you may lose sight completely out of one eye, um, or adjust the peripheral vision out of one eye. And usually you have to go to the hospital almost every time these happen, just to rule out a a massive stroke. Sometimes they're a signal that there's going to be a massive stroke coming within the next 48 hours. So they usually do a bunch of brain scans and keep you for observation. Is it like, uh, I know that when there's initially a patient with brain injury, there's a lot of fear and yeah. precautions for different types of, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, You're thinking about an aura before a seizure? Like a seizure. Is it like a, Kind of maybe maybe to help it. I'm not even working with seizure. It's kind of a. The aura is pre seizure. That's what she was mentioning. When you smell and taste things, and yeah, like an anxiety attack. I get that. So I'm familiar with it. That can happen. Mine is mostly visual. I don't usually get the smell or the the taste of something. When I had my brain aneurysm, I did have that, and I'll get into that in just a bit. But the trans ischemic attack, it's. It's almost just like a stroke, except the symptoms only last between one and 30 minutes. They don't last until you get medication. They don't last until the doctors can get to you. And they don't always leave a lesion or a marking on your brain. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I just had one this past December and it left a lesion on my brain. And I just had one about three, four weeks ago and it didn't leave a lesion on my brain. So there's really no rhyme or reason to them. They just happen when they want to happen and you have to take it as it is and you have to go to the hospital and you have to sit there for you know 24 48 hours which can be annoying but I found little ways to make it a little more fun for me while I have to be there so but so those are the trans ischemic attacks so those happen periodically throughout the whole 20 years but they got pretty dormant after my son was around three four years old so in 2018, my son was nine years old, and I had a job um, in corporate America. My life was wonderful. I had the marriage, I had the job, I had the house, I had the white picket fence. I was going to college to continue to evolve and learn and get further on in my career and things like that, being a good example for my son, always at the school lunches, always at the school meetings, always at the baseball games and the baseball practices and the lacrosse and the so on and so on and so on. So a very, very busy, multitasking life, okay? In, that's okay. In, uh, do you have a question? Do you mean 2008? Yes. Because you said 2018. Oh, my apologies. Again, brain aneurysm survived. It was 2008. Because that kind of confused me when you were like just saying your son's almost 20 and then Actually, you said when I, he was nine. He was only nine. Thank you. Year. No, thank you for correcting me. It was 2009. It was not 2008. It was 2009, but I was 28, which is where the confusion comes in in my nice Caution or danger blonde thinking? That, yeah, it's the blonde thing and, you know, the, the few staples and stitches and so on. But um, so 2009. 
My son is nine years old. The whole life is the same way as I just said it. In January 2009, I was at work and all of a sudden I felt this trans schema attack happen. It's coming. I can feel it coming. I don't want it to come. I want to ignore it. I want to avoid it. I'm going to keep staring at this Excel spreadsheet. I can't see numbers. I can't grab the phone to dial anything. I was able to move, so I did walk into my boss's office and just kind of hit the door, and she knew. And so she called 911, and they came, and they picked me up from work, and I went to a <coughs> predominant hospital out in the Chapel Hill area. And trying to scheme attack. Oh, no, wait. They were saying migraines at that point, so they didn't do a full workup. They just gave me a cocktail of migraine medication and sent me home the same day. So it wasn't... I guess it wasn't as bad as it could have been, so they just went ahead and sent me home. So then in March, again, it happened, 2009. I was at work, except that time. My husband at the time came to pick me up from work, and we just went home. He, you know, do you want to go to the hospital? No, I really don't want to go to the hospital. They couldn't really do anything for me. I just want to go home. So I went home, took care of that one. It took about two, three days to get back from that one, because sometimes after you have a TIA, you kind of feel like you've been run over by a truck. So your whole body has to just shut down and come back. Um, it's not a lot of fun. So March through August, I would have intermittent headaches that were pretty bad. They weren't consistent, but they were bad. They weren't TIAs, they were headaches. And I would go to the doctor and the doctor would say, oh, it's just a migraine, let me give you a, a cocktail of, of medication, send you on home. That happened multiple times with multiple doctors and multiple hospitals, okay? In August, I had um, a situation where we were at dinner uh, with my son and my husband at the time and my aunt, and it had just ended, baseball season had just ended, we had just gone to a game. They won, they were excited. I was trying to get my son to do his homework at the table. It's about nine o'clock at night. That wasn't very smart, nine year old, do your homework nine o'clock at night, you just want a baseball game, I'm serious. So um, I gritted my teeth because he was frustrating me. And when I did that, something happened in my head. I don't know what happened, but something happened and my face went blank and I was in a lot of pain and I just didn't want to talk. I wanted to shut down. I didn't, like, I didn't know what to do about it. And for months, nobody really been listening to me. So really, what is there to do about it? My husband noticed the change in my, um, in my position and said, do you want to go home? Yeah, I want to go home. So he took me home and that night I was in my bed and I could smell gasoline. And I don't know why I could smell gasoline, but I remember smelling gasoline and I remember being so, 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 so cold. My husband at the time called the neurologist and said, hey, she's got this pretty bad headache. She's making some noises I've never heard her make before. And she's saying she can smell stuff and she's really cold. We'll just give her her migraine medication. She'll be fine. Okay. Took my migraine medication. I eventually fell asleep, thankfully. Woke up the next morning, still wasn't feeling so great. Now I've got, you know, another truck's run over me again, so let me take two or three days off of work to figure this out and miss the baseball games or the baseball practices and miss the school stuff and miss my friends and fail at this and fail at that because you just keep missing and getting further and further and further behind. So after that incident, I had pain every single day on a raging scale. And it was in my lower back and in my neck and in my head. And almost every time I would stand up from a sitting position, it would just be a shooting pain from my tailbone to my head. And sometimes it would make me yell out loud because it hurt that bad. I was going to work with the portable heat pads, you know, on my neck and on my shoulders and on my back, just trying to get through the day. I, don't, I can't tell you how many motions I took every day just to, to make it work. During all of this, I'm also seeing doctors. I'm seeing my PCP, oh, it's just migraines. I saw a neurologist at a predominant Chapel Hill hospital. You're getting older now, so your migraines are changing. I think you have bacillar migraines. He never checked, he never did a scan, he never checked to see if any of the anatomy of my head had changed from the last time he looked at it seven years ago. So he gave me a bunch of medication. <clears throat> said, this is your regimen now, this is what you need to do, this is gonna fix your migraines. Okay, so I went, well, I went to the pharmacy to get those medications, and the pharmacist said, I can't give you all of this. If I give you all of this and you take it, you're going to die. But I can tell that you're in a lot of pain, 
So I'm going to give you what I can, and we have a call into your doctor, and we'll wait and hear from him. Okay, so I took what I could, and I went home. Well, I went home. I took what I could. I went to bed. I got up a few hours later, was still feeling just horrible, and um, I ate some ramen noodle soup because, you know, the cooking days were gone because this had just interrupted every aspect of my feeding and of my life, and just, it was like a, a plague just running through everything that I had, had worked so, so hard for. So I went back to bed that next morning. I woke up. I couldn't hold down coffee. I couldn't hold down water. I could barely walk. I could barely open my eyes. I didn't know what was wrong. I was, you know, aware enough to email my boss and tell her I wasn't going to be in work that morning, which just another day of not being there. And I went downstairs and I made a cup of coffee and I always walked my son to the bus stop. Always. I couldn't do it that morning. I just, I, my body could not do it that morning. So I was able to get out on the front porch. The school bus went by, my son was on it. I waved at it. I went back upstairs. I went into my bed, called my neurologist, said, hey, I took what you told me to take. I, something's really wrong. I don't know what it is, but something's not right. Please call me back. I waited hours. And I was in and out of consciousness while I waited those hours. I was asleep. I was awake. I would sleep. But I didn't know I was sleeping. I didn't know I was going to sleep. I'd just wake up and be like, oh, I must have taken a nap. Or, oh, I must have slept. I wasn't getting up. I wasn't eating. I wasn't going to the bathroom. I was just literally laying. Um, I called my PCP. Sounds like you have another migraine. Why don't you come in for a shot? No, I don't want to come in for a shot. I'm done with the shots. Something's wrong. So the um, neurologist called me back, his nurse called me back, and she said, well, he's at the prison today, but he thinks it sounds like you have the flu, so he's called in Tamiflu for you to the pharmacy. Thanks, I appreciate that. I think I'll go to the ER now. So I had my girlfriend, who's a Duke Life Flight nurse, who comes into this story again a little later, take me to the ER. I had a dish towel over my face because I couldn't deal with the sunlight and I could barely get in and out of her van and barely get up and down out of the chair and triage to get to my room to lay down in the bed. I got to the bed, the guy says, are you pregnant? No, I'm not pregnant, I'm in a lot of pain. Can we do something about this? Well, we gotta know if you're pregnant or not. I'm not pregnant, could you please? <laughs> like, I hurt. <laughs> no, we gotta know if you're pregnant. Okay, well, do whatever you have to do to find out if I'm pregnant or not, but I hurt and this needs to stop. Okay, fine. So they dope me up with a bunch of medication again. What's your pain scale 1 to 10? Don't you love that question? What's your pain scale 1 to 10? Your 4 might be my 10. Or my 10 might be your 4. So how do you really know? I've done 12. It's scheduled. You can't take things 12. There you go. So, you know, I'm like, it's 15. It's 15. Please help me. So I get the pain medication. Knocks me out. Right? I don't know if it was pain medication that knocked me out or the brain aneurysm at that point that knocked me out, but something knocked me out, so I'm sleeping. I wake up and they turn around and they say, so what's your pain? From one to 10. Well, it's kind of like a six now. Oh, you can go home. I can go home because my pain level is a six, but I still can't walk. I still can't walk straight. I still have massive pain that is visible to these doctors and this medical staff. You can go home. Great, thanks. I didn't want shots anymore. So I went to the ER to get an answer. Somebody's got to help me. I'm tired of being sick all the time. This is not me. This is not my life. This is not what I work for. So I went home. What choice did I have? Went back to my PCP and told him the situation. He said, okay, well, we're going to get you into another neurologist. Now, this is late September, early, early October. We're going to get you into a different neurologist because obviously this Chapel Hill place is not doing what it's supposed to do or, you know, taking you seriously enough. Okay. So they get me into a predominant Durham practice. I'm trying not to be an infomercial for anybody. Can y'all tell? Can you guess where it is? Can anybody guess? Duke. There you go. Good job. But what was the first one? There you go. Awesome. Okay. So Duke. Duke Neuro. Oh, that hurt my heart. That hurt my heart. I'm a Carolina fan. I mean, Grant is going to forever, but I'm still a Carolina fan. Um, Wolfie. Oh, 
I'm just thrilled to have an answer. So Thursday about 4.15 calls me on my cell phone and I'm at work on my heating pads and everything else. And he says, so I think we have an answer as to why you're having all these symptoms you're having. And I said, okay, well, what is it? I'm fully prepared for an MS answer. And the answer is you have a giant aneurysm behind your left eye. Okay, I'm still ecstatic that I have an answer. Like I want to jump up and down out of my chair if my body would let me because I was so excited to have an answer. I also didn't know anything about aneurysms at that point. You know, I'm 29 years old, so why should I? Why would I? So he said, well, we need to get you for another scan, an MRA scan. I said, okay, fine. When can that happen? He said, scheduling's gonna call you. Scheduling called me within about 10 minutes. And they said, okay, well, when can you get in? And at this time, you know, at this point, I'm being docked for pay. I have no more paid time off. I'm asking for a scan first thing in the morning or on the weekends or at night. And the lady on the phone is like, well, it's two months and we can get you in on a Saturday. And I said, you know, based on what, this is me, not the doctor. Based on my gut and what was just told to me five minutes ago, when's your next scan available? Tomorrow morning at nine. I will be there. I will be there. And I was, I was there. So I got to scan that one only took about 10 minutes, thankfully. Got to scan that morning. The hospital's right here. The doctor's office, the neurologist's office is right here. So I got my scan and I walked to the neurologist's office at 9.30, said, hey, can you tell me what the scan says? We don't know yet. You just told me I have this giant thing behind my eye and my brain, but my results can't get to you on a stat status. And I have all the symptoms, because now I've Googled aneurysm. I have all the textbook symptoms of a ruptured aneurysm, and I've had them for months. And you can't get those results stat. Somebody please explain that to me. Please, anybody. Because I can't believe it's possible that it could be that nonchalant. So anyway, they tell me they don't have the results yet. I said, okay, I'm gonna go get breakfast because Denny's is across the street and I'll come back. So I come back after breakfast, hey, have you heard anything? No, we still don't have the results. Okay, well, I'm gonna walk my hurting butt across the street to the hospital, get my own copy of the scan, and I'm gonna bring it back to you, and that's exactly what I did. Do you have the results? Can you read it? Can you tell me what it says? This is a Friday. You just told me I have this aneurysm. I really wanna know something before the weekend. Yeah, he'll see you at 1.30. Okay, so I left, came back. 1.30, put me in the back room on the left, the last room, told me, yes, it's definitely an aneurysm, and it's, it's large, and I've got a brain surgeon coming to talk to you, but not your brain surgeon, a different brain surgeon, but I don't know if they can operate on it yet. Okay. <laughs> it's still an answer, but now this answer's starting to scare me. Now this answer's starting, starting to defeat me and deplete me on the inside. So the surgeon comes in, he jokes a little bit, says this, that, says the other thing, whatever, yeah, we're gonna clip it, which is the most invasive surgical procedure they can do. But because I'm a young, healthy 29-year-old, they think they can clip it and that's the best thing to do. I don't know many healthy people who have aneurysms. I don't think a healthy person generates aneurysms. I think anybody can generate aneurysms and I know that's true statistically as a fact. I'm an otherwise healthy 29-year-old female with an aneurysm, but I'm not a healthy 29-year-old female. Those don't have aneurysms. So um, the surgeon, my surgeon calls me later that day and says, yeah, we can clip it, but we can wait until after the holidays. It is December 4th. Again, textbook symptoms of a ruptured aneurysm day after day after day after day and you wanna wait until after the holidays. I told him I wasn't comfortable with that and said I'd like to go ahead and get it done. You just told me I had a ticking time bomb in my brain and I really don't want it there. Well, no, statistically, there's a less than 1% chance that it's gonna rupture. I've got all the symptoms that it's already started to rupture. But yeah, statistically, it shouldn't rupture. Okay, no, look, dude, my insurance pays 90-10 right now. After the first, it's gonna pay 80-20. So what do you wanna do? We'll get you in in the next 10 days. 
Money, 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 money. Right? Yep. There you go. So we'll get you in in the next 10 days. And they did on December 14th. I checked in to Duke. They did an angiogram. First time I ever had one of those. Everybody know what that is? No? Okay. So they go into your femoral artery through your groin and they snake a camera up there and they take a look and they inject your brain or your heart. They can do it to multiple different parts of your anatomy to get as much information as they possibly can. And it was their roadmap to the clipping surgery for the next day. So that's the first time they got their eyes on it as, you know, as closely as they possibly could. And it was one aneurysm on top of another aneurysm. So it was a snowman. It was a snowman. Like really, aneurysms, they grow, they get thinner and they, they get thinner and they burst. Mine got thin enough that it grew another thin layer on top of its already thin layer. So you had double bubble. I did, I had an aneurysm with a dome on it is what they call it in my medical records that are not accurate, mm. but that's what they call it. So he said, no worries, we can still clip it tomorrow. You know, I'll see you first thing in the morning, first case of the day. That's what they call us, they call us a case. So I was the first case on his calendar that day. Not the first person, not the first human being, yeah. the first case. So that next morning they wheel me down, they knock me out, they do the surgery, it takes about six and a half hours. I wake up about 11 o'clock that night. I have over 100 staples, they did staples that time, I had over 100 staples in my head. I could feel the wrap around my head and my hair was like crunchy because it had blood and it was nasty and it was whatever. My dad was there, I remember saying, hey dad, and he said, hey, how you feeling? I said, it hurts. He said, they're gonna give you something. I said, it's not gonna work because I was so used to nothing working. You know, that was the mindset I had. It hurts, it hurt when I woke up. It wasn't supposed to hurt when I woke up because it did what I was supposed to do. So now this is, we're gonna go down the it doesn't work road again. Anyway, they gave me Dilaudid for the first time. It works, it puts you to sleep, it takes your pain away. Boy, it is amazing. Don't go get some unless you're at the hospital and that's what you need, but it is amazing. <laughs> so that next morning I woke up and it was just me and the nurse at the time and his name was Andrew and I was rude to him and I really shouldn't have been, but I was in a totally different mindset and lifestyle at that time. So Andrew, hey, how you doing, Miss Hill? How, how you feeling? Andrew, man, I gotta get home, I gotta get up, I gotta walk, I gotta go, I got, I got a life to live, I, I wanna get back to my life, I did what I'm supposed to do, I wanna get up, I wanna walk. Well, I don't think you should really walk to shit. No, really, I need to walk, I wanna walk. I, I feel okay, I wanna walk. I got, you know, I'm going home, I wanna go home. He let me get up and walk. That was not a good idea. I wasn't 24 hours out of the completion of surgery. <clears throat> so after I walked, boy, I had a lot of head pain after that. And then I just kind of went back into the, I'm asleep, I'm awake, I'm not really all the way here kind of thing. Again, a lot, a lot, a lot of pain. I stayed in the hospital for all of 72 hours after that first surgery. When Duke sent me home from the hospital, I begged not to be sent home because I was in so much pain. Please do not send me home. I begged my family, I begged my caregivers, I begged my physicians, I begged the nurses, I begged the physical therapist, please do not send me home. I am worse off now than I was when I walked into this hospital. You're fine, it's just anxiety, we're gonna send you home. No, really, please don't send me home. So they sedated me and took my IVs out. I was home for 22 hours. During that 22 hours, I drank, I think, two of those really nasty insures. Do you wanna know the secret to drinking insure if you really have to drink it? Put it in the freezer. Put it in the freezer for like five or 10 minutes and then drink it somewhat fast, not brain freeze fast, but somewhat fast and it'll taste kind of like a milkshake. It tastes much better when it's really, really cold versus when it's like just out of the fridge. It's just gonna make you nasty. Anyway, so I wasn't getting up, I wasn't walking, I wasn't talking, I wasn't interacting. I've been home for 22 hours. I had 102 fever while I was at home. My husband called the resident on call, the neuro resident, and said, hey, she's got 102 fever, and she's not really walking, she's not really talking, she's not eating, you know, I can't get her to walk. Oh, just give her some Tylenol. <laughs> okay. So, he did, he gave me Tylenol. What good that did, I don't know. I, again, I was like, I didn't know what was going on. It was about anything at that point. My husband left to go to the drugstore to get a suppository because now the neuro resident is saying I have a migraine because I have a headache, which she called a migraine, because I'm constipated. Having eaten or drinking anything of substance in 
four days. But I'm constipated. <laughs> so he goes to the drugstore. While he went to the drugstore, he called my friend, who's a neighbor, the Duke Life Light nurse from earlier. He says, hey, can you come down and sit with her while I run? Because she can't be by herself. Yeah, sure, no problem. So she comes down. And she pulls me out of bed. And she says, you got to walk. You got to walk. So I walked from probably this wall to that brick wall over there, you know, on the other side of the courtyard. And I came back. And I was Igor walking. And I was in a lot of pain. And I was complaining. And uh, my husband came back. And he was yelling. He was, he was upset because he, she had gotten me to walk. And she said, well, she's in a lot of pain. And he was, you know. I mean, man, you need to get better. You don't want to do the things that get you better. Well, then F you and so on and so forth. So that was his attitude towards me at that point. I got up out of that chair and it took everything I had to run at him because I really wanted to punch him at that time. But that's not my personality. Please understand. Not at all is that my personality. So he moved out of the way and I went right for my bed and I laid down and I put the covers over my head and my friend, the Duke Life Lightner, she lifted me out of the bed. And at that time, my eyes went like this, and I started to projectile vomit everywhere. She told him, "You got it. She's got to go back to the hospital. She's got to go ambulance. She's got to go to truck. I don't care how she goes. She's got to go right now." So he gets me back to Duke. Duke scans my brain. I have a 6.5 millimeter shift in my brain from center line. I have blood, air, and fluid on my brain. I have what they say in my medical records is a brain fluid leak which they attempted to patch before they sent me home the first time, but never checked to see if it actually took. They also did not scan my brain post brain surgery to make sure that the clip had oscillated everything in there. So now I'm back at the hospital. I don't know my name. I don't know anybody. I don't know anything that's going on. Apparently I'm laughing a lot. I like to laugh a lot. So I guess when my brain shifted, I laugh a lot too. Um, they told him I was in the last 45 minutes of my life and they had to rush me back. And they did, they cut it open, they drained and relieved and whatever it is they have to do. I woke up in ICU, I believe it was the next day, and I was in what's called vasospasm. So I had a lot of aphasia, I couldn't talk. I could hear what people were saying and I understood most of what they were asking when they would ask questions of me, but I couldn't formulate an answer. I couldn't find it in my head. And I wasn't aware that that was happening until they asked me if I had a child. Well, I knew I had a child. I'm pretty sure I got one of those. I shook my head. And they asked me what that child's name was. I had no idea. I couldn't find it. I knew I was supposed to know it, but it, it was in there, but it wasn't there. So that really upset me. That's when I realized myself oh, something's really wrong. This is not supposed to happen. So vasospasm is basically, your carotid arteries are what controls the blood flow from your heart to your brain. That's what gets your brain and oxygen, your blood and oxygen to your brain, okay? So it can function properly. Mine was spasm, so it was, instead of being open like this, like a highway, it was more open like a country back road, okay? So there wasn't enough blood and oxygen getting to my brain for it to operate properly. So they gave me a bunch of blood pressure medication to lift up my blood pressure because they figured if we could get it going fast, let's see if her brain actually works, and then we'll figure out what to do from there. So they did that. I had, an, uh, I had three needles here. I had one in each groin. I had one here and here and here and here. So I swelled up like a big balloon, and I was hot. I remember being so hot when they did that. Um, when I had all that medication in my system, I was able to communicate some, not much. I was able to understand, but I wasn't really able to, you know what I mean? Okay. Formulate the conversation. Does that make sense? So my organs started to show that they didn't like all that blood pressure medication. So they backed me off of that. And they said, we have two choices. They were talking to my caregivers and my family. We didn't, the doctor, the surgeon was right here and my family was on this side of my bed. And I remember pulling the surgeon's hand and looking at it and asking him why. And he said, I don't know, but we're gonna do the best we can to fix it. And I remember that, I don't know why I remember that, but I remember that clear as day. I don't remember a lot of other stuff that happened, but I remember that. So the choices were, we can do a bypass of the spasming artery, which is invasive surgery again, 
and we're gonna mess with this artery that doesn't like to be messed with. Or we can do a verapamil ball, which is where they take an antispasming medication and they enter it directly into your brain. So they're gonna put it right into that artery that's spasming and they're gonna do it the same way they do an angiogram. They're gonna go up with the camera and all that kind of fun stuff. So that's what they agreed upon. I had a 20% success, or it had a 20% success rate, whether it would work or not. And if it didn't work, I was gonna be stuck in that, that functionality for however long. So they take me down to the angiogram room. They do it, I was awake, and I remember seeing all the TV screens. There's TV screens in there, so you can see, you can see your brain, you can see what they see. It's kind of cool if you think about it. I mean, how many people get to see the inside of their heart or the inside of their brain? Not many, so that was kind of cool, but anyway. So you're laying flat on a, on a metal table and I just had all of those fluids pumped into my body for the, for the blood pressure, right? So I'm laying down, you can't move when you have an angiogram, and I start coughing, just this little small fluid cough. And I remember thinking to myself, where did that come from? Didn't think much of it. Angiogram's done, the verapamil ball is done. I can talk. I can recognize people, I'm more aware, I can smile, I know my kid's name again. It took 22 minutes, 22 minutes from the time that they started the procedure to the time that medicine ball went in my brain, 22 minutes and it turned just like that. It's amazing. So I saw my family laid up or lined up on the wall and they were all excited and I was all excited and they decided mm -hmm. they were going to go to TGI Fridays, have a drink, have some chicken wings and cheese fries and you know all the things I can't have but that's okay y'all enjoy it so they went to dinner that's the last thing I remember before I remember having an oxygen mask on my face about two hours later because I can't breathe I'm in pulmonary edema at that point I can't breathe I'm trying to take this oxygen mask off and tell my family please go home I'm gonna be okay I can't formulate one syllable because I can't breathe and I'm looking at some of my family members and they have tears in their eyes and they're beside themselves and they're right in my face. I don't need that right now. <laughs> I appreciate it, but I really don't need that right now. And then I've got a family member in my ear telling me they're gonna bring you a CPAP, they're gonna give you some Lasix, they're gonna put you to sleep just so you can dry up and give you some time to calm down. Thanks for that, where's the CPAP? Why is it taking so long to get here? I still can't breathe. And I had some family members at the foot of the bed just kind of staying out of the way, but you could see the concern in their face. And the nurse, her name was Helen, I remember her. She was very nice, very diligent too, back and forth from machine to machine. She was running, she was doing everything she could do. CPAP comes, I get the Lasix, I go to sleep, I wake up at 3.30 in the morning and I can breathe. I can breathe and I can talk and I know where I am. So that was great, right? So that was the last major complication that I had from all of the stuff that we just talked about. I was sent home, I think it was 24 hours, no, 72 hours-ish after that, maybe four days, three or four days. I was sent home. When you're released from a neurosurgeon, they don't tell you that you're gonna go through an identity crisis. They don't tell you that your brain is not necessarily gonna function